So, uh, good morning. My name is Chris Reynolds, uh, and I work for a reinsurance company. So, when someone says reinsurance company, most people think of Swiss Re. I, I don't work for Swiss Re. I work for a company called Partner Re. Um, interesting thing about Partner Re, it's just been bought by um, the Agnelli family in Italy. So, we're now part of the same group that owns um, Ferrari and Juventus. So we're all hoping for free football tickets and a new car scheme, but um, t time will tell. Anyway, I'm not a data scientist. Um, I'm not a data analyst, technician, or statistician. Uh, I'm an actuary. And specifically, I'm a pricing actuary. I work in the life uh, business unit of our company, which means I'm very much focused on biometric risks. So I'm concerned about whether people um, fall ill, whether they become disabled, um, the risk that someone dies, or even the risk that they actually live too long. And uh, I guess the purpose of my talk today is to speak about our experience of implementing R in our life business unit. And I'll talk about where we were and the journey we went through and focusing on what I think were the key sort of uh, areas of success. I'll discuss where we are now and give a few examples and then I'll talk about where I think we've still um, got to go. So, uh, corporate comms make me put this standard disclaimer here. So basically, anything I say or do during the next 30 minutes, it doesn't necessarily reflect the view of the company. So, swiftly moving on. Um, where were we? So to begin with, I, I need to give you some context to our situation. The life business unit of Partnery consists of about 100 people spread across Zurich and Paris. And the vast majority of these people are actuaries. Um, we're a very actuarially heavy business. So a quick show of hands. Does anybody know what an actuary actually does? It's a very difficult sentence to say. OK, that's uh, probably what I expected. Um, so it just so happens that the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries are currently running a Twitter campaign and they're asking people to define what an actuary does in a single tweet. And here are some of the responses they received. So we've got some people here saying research and analysis to help with big decisions, uh, makes maths useful your entire life, analyze the past and give possible future outcomes, sounds a bit like a bookie. Um, and then finally, in the bottom right-hand corner, we've got uh, Tinty who perhaps is a little bit more honest, and she confesses that she's dated an actuary for the last six years and has no clue what um, he does. But here's one that I think is um, pretty fair. Uh, these suggest that actuaries are people who turn data into decisions. And that got me thinking, what, what's the toolkit of a typical actuary that they use to analyze data? And so I'm gonna generalize here but I think it's a fairly accurate generalization. Actuaries are people who love Excel, they will tolerate Axis, and they use a lot of custom actuarial software. So actuaries like to, well, actuaries have to project cash flows into the future, and they use custom software to do that, which is typically written by actuaries as well. And some of these actuaries are actually purported to be resistant to change. Um, I couldn't possibly comment. So, how do you then go about convincing a group of Excel-loving actuaries to give R a try? And you may say it's easy, you just say to them, okay, well, you're gonna have data sets in the future that are so big, there's no chance you're gonna be able to work in Excel with that. <laughs> Good luck with that argument. Um, because here's a real world example. A few years ago, I worked for an insurance company, um, which will remain nameless. And I can remember one time the actuaries were given a data set with about a probably half a million records in it. And, and what did the actuaries do? They basically, they split it into chunks of 65,000 because that was the worksheet um, data limit at the time. And then after they had uh, filled a lot of worksheets, if the workbook was too big, they would then start a new workbook and link through to that. And then what they found was actually the calculations were taking a long, long time. So they had a brilliant idea. They, um, they basically left the formula in the first row and then hard-coded the rest of the sheet. So you can imagine the absolute nightmare that was involved when a new data set came through and they were tasked with um, updating this, this spreadsheet. 
So how did we manage to convince the actuaries to try R? I think essentially we tried to make it as easy as possible for them. And I think at this point it's probably worth reflecting why, why we actually chose R, because it, it was very much a deliberate choice. We could have gone down the Python route or we could have gone with commercial software like SAS. I think we, we chose R because we really wanted the powerful visualization and we really liked the um, wide range of available libraries. So here are what I consider are some of the critical success factors of our implementation of R. The first is the server. So wh when we started playing with R maybe five years or so ago, we actually went down the route of um, local installs, which was an absolute nightmare. So each install, we had to get approval from IT. And then by the time we'd had that approval, we ended up with a load of people who had different versions of R, different versions of packages, and it was an absolute nightmare. On top of that, there was very little uh, consistency about the way people were actually using R. So you had some who were using R Studio as their ID, while others opted for something like, I don't know, WinEdit to um, edit their R scripts. Having the server meant that users didn't have to worry about a local install, and it ensured that everyone was using the same version in the same way. The second factor I've got here is IT. Um, but not just IT, it's, it's a sort of cooperative IT. And when we wanted to try this server, uh, our company is, um, has a lot of experience with Microsoft products, and we actually wanted to try a, a Linux server. So the way we did this, in, in somebody's office, we basically got our own box, and we set up a, a VM on that. And then once we could demo to IT that this actually worked, they were very supportive in getting that transferred to our data center in the US. The third point, uh, um, basically a handful, and really just one or two um, kind of R champions. So people who, on top of their day-to-day -day job, were responsible for continually banging the R drum. So they were the people who really showed others what could be done, and they kept asking the question, have you tried this in R? And then the final one is um, our R Souls discussion group. Um, <laughs> corporate comms said I should be careful with that. Um, so this is one we borrowed, or if you prefer, stole from um, Lloyds of London. So um, if you know Marcus Gesman, who spoke yesterday, um, I remember a while back he, he told me about this R Souls discussion group they had in Lloyds and how it helped to get it ingrained in the company. And we thought that sounded like a great idea, so we decided to adopt it in partnery as well. So every month or so, we have this meeting where people from life and the non-life business units as well will get together and somebody will show something interesting that they've done in R. So where are we today? Um, this is our current infrastructure. Now, for the people who are interested in this, um, we basically have a data center in the US with a virtual machine running Despian Linux that's been allocated, I'm told, eight cores, 24 gig of RAM, and 100 gig of disk. Okay, I don't care about that. All I care about is that it works and it's easy for my team to use. And this server as it stands at the moment it basically supports, I'd say, about six to eight R developers across um, both the life and non-life business and a much larger number of um, shiny users. And really, I think over the last 18 months, we've not hit any um, resource limits during that period. And we use um, RRD tools to monitor the load. And I think if we needed more resource, we would put a request into IT, and I'm sure they would support that. But I think perhaps more importantly than the actual infrastructure here is the supporting infrastructure that we had around it. And, and that's where the cooperative IT really comes in. So by this I mean they, um, they basically uh, used our centralized login, our active directory, so that we didn't need to worry about managing um, credentials on the server. They also enabled us to access um, our corporate network drives directly from the server so that we could easily transfer data back and forth. Um, thirdly, they set up ODBC connections to our database servers so that we could read and write data as we needed to. 
And then I guess the other standard things we had were basically backup schedules and um, uh, server monitoring. So all the actuary now needs to do is fire up their browser and go to our stat server. And then this is the landing page they get to. Now, um, following a guy talking about brand and design, clearly this is not the best design, but um, it's basically a, a, a wiki, which we use as our homepage. Um, the idea being that for non-programmers, it's easy to maintain and to add any support and documentation. And up the top here, you can see there's a link for RStudio. So if they click on that, that takes you to the familiar RStudio ID. And of course, now every user will be using the same ID um, and the same version. And so what do we actually use R for? Basically, three things. Analyzing data sets, fitting statistical models, and visualizing data. So as an example, we write a lot of longevity business in the UK. And every couple of years, we will update our longevity benchmark. R is a key tool in doing that. So we use R to basically uh, manipulate the data. We will then use it to visualize that data. And then we will probably um, either fit a generalized linear model or some survival models to that data to derive an internal longevity benchmark. Of course, we then need to communicate that to management. And you sort of don't really want to show them your um, R Studio IDE at that point. And I think that's where um, something like R Markdown came in really helpful for us in terms of internal communication. Um, and what was great here as well was you produce this, and then, of course, when you get a new data set next year, you can just refresh it and change some of the supporting text. And the, the other thing we've tried to do is basically encourage familiarity with a core set of packages. So, for example, we, we make very heavy use of dplyr, uh, ggplot, um, tidyr, and I think most R users in partnery would be very familiar with these. And you'll also notice that we've, um, we've created our own uh, internal package. Um, the thing in here was that basically it gives us our corporate colors and um, corporate fonts. So those are readily available to users. Um, and it's also got some sort of convenience functions for data cleansing that, that we commonly use. So what else have we got here? Well, we've got a stack of um, shiny applications. Um, which can also be accessed from the homepage. And I'd like to briefly talk about uh, three of these that, um, that we've got. So the first is our CAT Excel terrorism tool. Um, so CAT Excel, CAT Excel stands for Catastrophe Excess of Loss. So this is a type of reinsurance designed to protect the insurance company against a catastrophic event that will affect lots of their policies. So the reinsurer would basically pay out if the total claims suffered by the insurer exceeded um, a given amount in a specified period. So you would think like um, something like the Twin Towers would be a catastrophic event, and that's where the reinsurers would step in. Um, and internally, we've got a, a CAT Excel pricing model which is calibrated to a number of different assumptions. And one of the um, assumptions we use is the terrorism risk in different countries. And so before we had this tool, basically what someone had to do was they would go to the Foreign Office website and they would spend literally a few days going through all the country pages, um, checking what the current terrorism risk in each of those countries was and updating the tool. We've now got this shiny application, and a user can go in. They can choose uh, whichever countries they want, or they can check the Get All Countries tab. They click the button, and basically what the tool does, it goes away, it scrapes the, um, the relevant pages on the Foreign Office website, and then we've got a series of functions that basically go through the text. They identify where terrorism is um, described, and then they extract the risk and when that was last updated. And for those who don't li like tables, we also show that information on a map. And um, we've also got an option to download the file as a CSV so that it can be input straight into a CAT Excel model. 
Our second application is uh, all about mortality improvements. So as life insurers, we're not only concerned with the, your current rate of um, mortality, we're also interested in whether it's going to improve or deteriorate um, in the future. And we've built a shiny app to assist with this as well. So the user goes in, they select the country they want, they select the age range, they select the years, um, they select the gender. And when they click the smoothing button at the bottom, the app basically does three things. It goes off to the human mortality database. Yes, there is such a thing. And it extracts um, an up-to-date uh, extract. It then smooths this mortality data using a, a two-dimensional penalized spine. And finally, it calculates the year-on-year -year mortality improvement rates. And if you were to scroll down on this, you would then see that we display the results on a pair of heat maps. And the idea here is that hotter colours represent higher levels of mortality improvement, whereas the cooler covers are, cooler colours are lower levels of improvement or even deterioration. And then the, the final um, apps I'd like to talk about basically re relate to a group um, a group business proposition. So by group business, I essentially mean employee benefit schemes. So if you think um, a company, for example, would provide death cover for their employees, what that company does is they buy a group life cover from an insurance company. The insurance company then passes on some, or maybe quite a lot of that risk to the reinsurer. As well as assuming the risk, what we do as a, as a re reinsurance company is actually give the insurance company a pricing tool to use. And the good thing about this is that every time that company then does a quote, the information from that quote gets uploaded to our centralised database. And then we've got a um, series of shiny apps that we use to monitor and explore that database. So here you can see, um, so where I've got different sedents, I've had to anonymize this. Um, these are basically different companies and different insurance companies. And here you can see the age distribution of the um, business that's coming through from them. And the idea here is that an actuary who knows group business can look at this and he can say, okay, something looks a bit strange here. Um, clearly, if you look at this sedent eight, there's something wrong here, and that would warrant um, further exploration. Similarly, um, another key factor when we're pricing group business is occupation class. So you look at um, the job someone's doing, and that gets mapped to an occupation class, um, basically occupation class one to four. And once again, the actuary comes along and says, okay, is this what I expect? Am I seeing some unusual patterns here? And then um, we've recently started making use of a Shiny Dashboard to get live updates on the quote activity of different sedents. So you can see in the top left-hand corner there, you've got a drop-down. You can choose the sedent you want, and then you'll get an up-to-date view of how many quotes they've done, how many of those quotes they've referred to us, how many have been declined, etc. And of course, you can click on the graphs um, option and get a chronological view of the same information. So you can see um, where we're getting the bulk of activity. Is that activity increasing or is it decreasing? So that's where we are at the moment. Um, and I guess the question for us now is, is where are we going and what, what do we still want to do? So one thing that we're very excited about internally is, is the package radiant. Um, I don't know who's looked at that, but we've looked at it over the last few months. And um, for our line of work, it's, it's really interesting because what we do a lot of the time is take data from different sources, we cleanse it, we convert it, we put it into some sort of standardized formats. And radiant has some real potential here. So it enables someone with very little, practically no knowledge, to explore a data set, cleanse it, visualize it, and, and transform it. And um, it's something we started looking at, but I really think um, we're going to invest a lot more effort in that in the future. 
The, the other areas where we've got um, more work to do, so Git version control. Um, we've got this up and running, and some users have adopted it, but truthfully, it's, it's really struggling to get some traction. Um, I suspect the barrier to entry may be a little bit too high for some users. We, we've basically produced a user guide for dummies, but what I think we're lacking is a sort of Git champion or, or someone to really, um, yeah, champion the cause of Git. The, the second one um, is, is RxL. So we looked at RxL maybe four years ago, and then I think when Shiny came along, we all got excited about that, and we forgot about RxL. But, but if we look at the company today, we've still got a very big Excel user base, and the question for me is, can we use RxL to empower that user base somehow? Now, if anyone's got experience of RxL, I'd be very interested in hearing your thoughts. The third one is um, a production server. So at the moment, we run um, R on a server that's classed as pre-production. I think as we become more dependent on the infrastructure and it becomes business critical, it's likely we want to move to a production server for greater levels of support. And then finally, um, something we'd probably like to explore, maybe just for fun at this stage, is using dplyr with databases. So at the moment when we use dplyr, we basically load everything into memory first and then we use dplyr. Um, We've talked about actually doing it directly on the database, um, but it's not something we've really progressed yet. So that's a lot for me. Um, as I said earlier, R was a choice, and it was one we made because we wanted the powerful data visualizations. I think what we've really come to appreciate over time is basically Shiny and the deep, tool, uh, the deep pool of available talent and support that's out there. So thanks very much for your time.